Our first reading this morning from Psalm 137 was written as an encouragement to the people of Jerusalem as their city and their temple were in ruins. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sit down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Our second scripture lesson this morning is Jeremiah's letter to the exile was to bring them hope. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. On January 27th, as we in California were reeling from mass shootings in Monterey Park and in Half Moon Bay, the city of Memphis and cities across our nation were preparing themselves for the Memphis Police Department to release video of the footage of Memphis police officers beating Tyree Nichols, a beating that led to Mr. Nichols' death three days later. The following day on January 28th, the Reverend Terry Hort Owens, the general minister and president of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, issued a statement and I posted a link to the full statement on the church's Facebook page and Twitter account if you want to read the full statement, this is just a part of what Reverend Hordoan said. It is with deep lament that I find myself inviting the church into prayer for the family of Tyree Nichols and the community of Memphis in the wake of the video footage released yesterday of the death of Tyree Nichols at the hands of Memphis police officers. Another black man has died at the hands of police. Another mother grieves the untimely and tragic death of her son. Another video summons our outrage and our cries for moral clarity and action. I've been in communication with the Reverend Dr. Crystal L. Williams, Tennessee Regional Minister, as she supports our pastors and communities across the city of Memphis. I encourage the church to join them as Reverend Dr. Williams encouraged in her message yesterday. <clears throat> Our faith gives us hope when confronted with systems beyond reform. Our faith gives us hope. Today and for the following two Sundays, Pastor Brenda and I will be offering a brief sermon series on cultivating hope. 
The reality is that we could probably preach a full year just on the topic of hope. We could spend a full year exploring what hope isn't and what hope is, how hope lives in our bodies and how hope travels on our stories, and finally, on the practice of hope. Thus, in three sermons, we will only scratch the surface of the topic of hope. Nonetheless, I invite you to engage with this series and consider your understanding and practice of hope, particularly as it relates to your faith. Now, I've tried during the past week to understand why I have been more disturbed by the death of Tyree Nichols than by the deaths in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay or in last Saturday's mass shooting in Los Angeles a week ago. I think it boils down to this. The homicide of Tyree Nichols was at the hands of people who are supposed to protect us. I worry that and I, I say that, that the, the whole issue of Tyree Nichols' death being at the hands of people who are supposed to protect us, I, I don't in any way excuse the mass shooters in what they did. And in fact, I worry a little bit that perhaps I'm becoming numb to mass shootings, that the mass shootings are not causing the cognitive dissonance that the death at the hands of police officers is causing for me. The story of, in Genesis of the murder of Abel by Cain teaches us that we are our siblings' keepers, that we are responsible for the welfare of each other. That should be such a part of who we are that someone shooting someone else should cause cognitive dissonance in me, and it doesn't, at least not to the extent that the death of Mr. Nichols brings up in me. The death of Tyree Nichols at the hands of police officers moves me into a place of despair, and in that place of despair, I find it hard for me to feel hope. And as I've reflected on this reality, I realize that perhaps I'm having trouble finding hope, experiencing hope, because I am confusing hope and optimism. Our first scripture lesson comes from a place of that kind of despair. The Babylonian exile, the Babylonian empire has conquered Israel, and vast numbers of Israelites have been sent into exile. Without a doubt, religious and political elites were rounded up and exiled in Babylon's and probably vast numbers of common folk as well. While they were there, their captors demanded that they sing songs from the old country. But how can we sing songs in a foreign land? How can we sing God's songs in a foreign land? It is in the midst of this exile that Jeremiah preaches, and we hear Today's second lesson. Jeremiah says that the exile is going to last a while, 70 years. Then God will bring the Israelites back to Jerusalem. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. This is supposed to be good news. Though, if I'd been a 30-year-old temple priest who had been sent into exile, 70 years, I'll be 100, which means I'll probably be dead. Not exactly good news. I'm not going to see Jerusalem again. Perhaps that is why the psalmist sang, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. 
Maybe this good news from Jeremiah isn't so much a word that gives the 30-year-old priest hope as one that gives optimism. Marianne McKibben Dana, the author who inspired this sermon series, says optimism does its best work in the before, when the evidence points possibly to a positive direction, when you can still anticipate the best possible outcome, when things could work out okay, but when the facts suggest otherwise, Optimism isn't enough. This is when hope comes in, rolls up her sleeves, and says, Optimism, take a seat. Okay, we're in exile. We're in exile because the Babylonian Empire is about as powerful an empire as we've ever seen. But empires don't last forever. They eventually fall. And when that happens, maybe Jeremiah is right. Maybe when that happens, our descendants will get to return to our beloved Jerusalem. Our exiled priest might say, I hope that happens. But in fact, what he means is, I'm feeling optimistic that that's a possibility. Hope is different. I've heard optimism described as a mathematical construct, writes Dana, an equation in which past experience plus present striving equals future greatness. Optimism relies on external circumstances lining up in a certain way. Hope isn't mathematical. It's philosophical, physical, maybe even musical. True hope defies cause and effect and has impact regardless of the outcome. I think I know what she means. When I look at the reports from the scientists who crunch the numbers, I don't feel optimistic about humanity's facing of the climate crisis. When I look at the decisions being made, at the policies being adopted or failing to be adopted, I can fall into despair. And yet somehow, even in the midst of that despair, I can feel hope. Because I get an email from a church member who says she wants to organize our congregation to participate in a nationwide day of action on March 21st to address the climate crisis. I feel hope because there is a way that hope says roll up your sleeves with me and let's get to work. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says optimism and hope are not the same. Optimism is the belief that the world is changing for the better. Hope is belief that together we can make the world better. So here's some good news. Hope is a muscle that can be exercised. Research shows that hopeful people have access to two kinds of thinking that merely optimistic people don't. The first type of thinking is called pathway thinking, which allows people to imagine many possible approaches to a situation in pursuit of a goal or outcome. The second is agency thinking. It is a sense of personal empowerment and motivation to work to pursue these goals or outcomes. Pathway thinking dreams of many possible futures. Agency thinking tries to bring them about. Last week, we had our annual financial meeting. The congregation chose not to adopt a budget for 2023. Now, I could be wrong, but my sense was that a majority of people felt that the proposed budget was too greatly out of balance and that it was poor stewardship to adopt it without a plan to bring the budget into balance, if not this year, soon. I think we can be hopeful about the budget without needing to be optimistic about the budget. But it's going to take some work. First, we have to access pathway thinking. 
We need to spend time imagining many possible approaches to the situation in pursuit of our goal, namely a balanced budget. That is what I hope will happen in the small group gatherings. Let me rephrase that. I am optimistic <laughs> that that will happen in the small group gatherings that start today, that we will access that pathway thinking, and then we will need to access our agency thinking, harnessing our sense of empowerment and motivation to work towards our goal together, utilizing the pathways, or at least some of the pathways we come up with. This is the hope that Jeremiah called the Israelites to in the midst of exile. He offered pathways, and the people had the agency to engage them. Continue to search for God with all your heart. Look for ways to restore your fortunes in the midst of exile. Trust that God will bring you back to your beloved Jerusalem. Believe that God's plan is one for welfare and not for harm, one that gives you a future with hope. Perhaps the despair I feel when I contemplate the death of Tyree Nichols comes from the fact that I have trouble harnessing pathway thinking. Racism and police violence seem so intractable, it's difficult for me to imagine possible approaches to the situation to change the system. And yet, we can work together. Each of us can remember that we are not confronted with systems that seem to be and perhaps actually are beyond reform on our own. That confrontation happens to all of us together, and together we just might be able to imagine approaches to reform or replace the unjust systems. And then we can work together to bring about the needed transformation. That, I think, is the hope that our faith gives us. Amen.